Welcome to the Team Talk with Tom and Jack. I'm Tom. I am Jack. And this is episode one. It is indeed. Tom Rose, are you excited for episode one? I'm excited for Good. episode one. Good. I'm excited too. Uh, we host this podcast to inspire coaches, teachers and parents in order to help improve children's well-being together. This is episode one where we discuss well-being. So we're going to break that up into physical, mental and social well-being. We discuss uh, a, wide range, a wide range of topics, but uh, the main ones are uh, our experiences of well-being as children, as adults, our experiences of well-being as coaches, so the well-being that we observe day-to-day in our jobs of the children we work with. And lastly, we're going to touch on self-care, some practical take-home tips that we're going to share with you that we've either learned from our reading or personal experience that we have had as coaches. So we we'll hope you enjoy it, team. This project couldn't have started without the sponsorship of Teammates. That's right. Teammates is our sports coaching company that we co-founded back in 2016. For more information, please head to weareteammates.com. Now, back to the podcast. Well, it's our, it's our first podcast. It is. It is. And we're going to start it off with, a, with an explanation, aren't we? Tom, who are you? Well, I'm Tom. Uh, some of his people who do know me, uh, you'll know me probably through either teaching or coaching or P coordination, school governance. I've done a quite a few different roles. Um, I grew up with this fella to my left called Jack here. Jack, more information from you. Who are you? Hi, I'm Jack. Uh, I'm Tom's friend. Uh, I'm also a, like Tom is, a trained teacher. Uh, I, uh, well, we were, we were childhood friends. We grew up across the road from each other. Uh, but more importantly, we started our coaching business teammates about four years ago. So the f- last four years of our life have been predominantly around Tom and I working together as business partners, co-directors, uh, leading teammates, which has been an amazing four years. Uh, and now Tom and Jack is where we are. We're moving, not moving on, but we're sticking with teammates and doing this as well, aren't we? We certainly are. This is the first podcast. What is what, what is the first podcast, Tom? So, first of all, why are we interested in sort of well-being and why, why has this podcast come about? Um, first of all, we're interested in well-being uh, because of our interaction with children on a day-to-day basis, obviously through our jobs. Um, we grew up together as, as children over the road from one another, uh, went on family holidays and all that sort mm. of thing. We, we go back. Um, so, we've already, always been interested in, in well-being within children and we've always for the last four years had a little bit of a oh, what could we do next sort of thing with with teammates alongside it so teammates is our sports coaching company um what can we do alongside it how can we expand the vision um so we're now into basically what it is that we really are i don't like the word passion but yeah. what it is that we're passionate about and that is children's well-being yeah we want to contribute to the conversation and the debate that is improving children's well-being um we don't want to come across and hopefully we won't come across as telling people what to do it's no. not instructional whatsoever it's just we want to um what was that word we, we want to contribute yeah, contribute that's the one contribute we want to contribute to the uh, discussion and i mean we work with children every day don't we um, and you know, like you say, it is our passion, and we want to share what it is that we do because we like to think that it has a pretty good level of, um, you know, it's quite effective and it is it is quite successful. Um, There's a problem though. There is a problem. Well being, mental health, the, the the whole sort of. It's subjective, isn't it? It's one one person's well being is different to somebody else's, isn't it? So we, we really struggled to come up with a, a term that we wanted to hanker down on and, and actually use. Um, so we've gone with the, with the term well-being, but we know that there are different you know ways in which you can interpret it. We didn't want to go down the mental health route because there are certain connotations. So we thought well-being probably encapsulated the best, most tangible way of communicating what it is that we mean when we say that what yeah. we're, we're talking so when, about when we say we want to improve children's well-being the three main components and there are three aren't there are children's mental health physical health and their social health really so how they socialize with their peers how they um you know how they are mentally and you know what we can do to improve their physical health as well so that's what we're going to go with those mainly that three-pronged attack of mental health physical health and social health 
Absolutely. So the current state of play with regards to where we are, I suppose, nationally in this sort of time era that we're, we're, we're living in is um, there's kind of a, a wave forming, I, 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 I think I'm safe in saying, towards a, a more uh, acceptance towards mental health as being as important as you know the physical side of things and social side of things still very early days mm. uh still a lot of terminology that is you know a bit mm, is that real world or is that a bit hippie or you know all that sort of thing um so hopefully today we're going to go through um a bit more about our experiences straight out the gate with those three three prongs and then um carry on from there so yeah so we're gonna it seemed like a long time ago, but it wasn't actually that long ago, was it? When we were um, when we were children ourselves, and our experiences of uh, our physical, mental, and social well-being uh, at school, outside of school, those sort of things. So the thing we're going to kick off with, really, I think, were things that we, looking back on our childhoods, um, what were what were things that we you know we thought were really good for our for our well-being, and things actually we look back on and go, do you know what that wasn't. You know, potentially that was actually quite detrimental to our well-being. So the thing that I know that we both share that we think was definitely a really strong point of our childhoods was not only the amount of physical activity that we were doing, but the quality of it as well. Um, so yeah, I'll let you kick off with that. Physical activity as children, I think it was good, wasn't it? So yeah, physical activity as children, um, we were both really quickly into sport young, um, from like the age of, I don't know, as soon as we could yeah. get into it really. Yeah. Um, and that has had social impacts, which we'll come to in a bit, but primarily the fact that we were out and about running, moving a lot, um, has, has definitely helped us physiologically, um, as well as all the other sorts of things. So we had played a variety of sports. I know I went through football, cricket, rugby, golf, like a, a real pretty big range of different sports. Jack, sports Yeah, for you? very similar really, football, cricket, Dabbled in rugby. Um, I salute rugby players because I just I didn't didn't get on with that at all. It was way too physically demanding for me, and I, I still to this day love watching rugby. But the idea of playing it, crikey Moses! Um, yeah, a lot of tennis. I only started playing golf recently, actually, so that wasn't really part of my childhood. Um, a lot of bowls, especially on the beach as well. Um, so yeah, but cricket and football were the main ones, I think, for me. Mm. And I think you were as well, weren't you there? Cricket yeah, and and bowls. definitely. Um, and I suppose we bring on to the physical adult side of mm. things. Um, so we now still play sport. Yeah. Um, I personally have taken a bit of a step back from the competitive side of sport yep. just for time reasons work reasons and other things that i feel like a lot of young adults adults sort of do um i hope to get back into the more competitive side of things i think once things calm down a little bit here at work yeah um and other than that i go to the gym regularly and do a lot of you know sort of strength uh, running all the usual bits and pieces around that kettlebell work and, and what have you to stay in you know uh, good physical condition um but for my body uh stuff around you know injury prevention and things because obviously with our jobs we're very much out and about running playing pretty much sport quite a lot of the time with the children that we've you know demonstrating or you know if teams down and we'll play every now and again to fill in a left back position in football for example and things yeah. like that Jack, what about your physical? I'm just, just on the side, I have seen you commandeer the uh, the striker role recently. <laughs> yeah, your your appearances to goals ratio is impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was really lucky in that I so having worked now for as closely as we have nearly day in day out together for the past four years. Only recently um, have I, so I was at university for three of the last four years. Um, 2016, I think. Yeah. Yeah, two thousand sixteen to two thousand nineteen, mm. and only recently um, you sort of got me into going to the gym. So I played a lot of football at university, and I still play competitive football now. But you sort of were quite instrumental in encouraging me to go to the gym, support me in going to the gym, 
Um, and now I go, I don't go as often as you do, but I go, we go to the same gym. We usually go together. Um, we meet there, have routines and whatnot. So I've recently got into the gym and you have done that, um, you know, for your for physical health and prevention. That's an element of that for me as well. But one of the main drivers for me was actually, I play um, weekend football. I play quite a lot of football in the week, but I play competitive football at the weekend. And I wanted to be more physically competitive, so faster, quicker, stronger, faster and quicker, obviously same thing, but stronger, uh, more flexible, more, you know, but I was playing football and feeling like it was having an impact on me for the rest of the week because my body just wasn't prepared for it. Um, so I did a lot of, or I do do a lot more gymming now in order to be more competitive. Um, and I love the competitive side of the football at the weekend. The social side is brilliant. Some of the guys who I played with and I started playing football when I was six, um, and also the, the manager of my under six football team and the guys I played with, we all play in this team now. Um, so that's a brilliant, brilliant um, aspect of it socially, which I think we'll come on to. Yeah. Now when we the social role of sport, so we've spoken about how it's physically really useful for us in terms of our physical health, in terms of injury prevention, in terms of, you know, in relation to playing sport. But if we talk about the social side of it now, yeah. um, I know that um, you played pretty a pretty strong level of bowls when you were younger didn't you and you had a pretty, pretty unique. important role in that bowls team yeah so for me similar to jack um i used to play football and still play football with you know sort of close friends now still so we've, i've got that side of things but yeah as a as a as a child or as a young person the sport uh, sorry the role that sport played for me socially was probably the biggest thing um being able to talk to adults, being able to talk to other people about things outside of sport, uh, be a part of a team, that sort of thing was big. And then back to your point, um, I used to play um, what's referred to as like lawn bowls. So it's not like crown green bowls where you all bowl into the middle, it's sort of like in, in, in its own lanes, which is usually associated with kind of old people, uh, people who are retired, uh, you know, down, down at the coast sort of sport. Um, anyway, my nan, took me along once when I was young and I don't know how old I was I'm gonna say young I'm gonna guess at about 11 or 12 I don't know how young I was but either way um yeah so my nan just took me along to the local bowls club um and then based on the kind of positive verbal feedback that I received from the people around who were like oh that's really good that you did that and oh you know you did well that kind of like ego boosting mm. was very effective to get me to yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to, to go on because I, I know I was at a pretty vulnerable state I, I would say as a child at that at that age and that time so for me that was a real boost and yeah. I thought right and then I got sucked into it and then I started playing for Middlesex and other things as a under 25 bowls player which was its own interesting story but I suppose the, the, the main thing that I took from it was similar to Jack now I know you did something similar with football mm. but I did um, I was I was roped in basically as uh, 15 years old I was the club captain so I would orchestrate uh, team selection uh, go do AGM sort of things and basically have to do all of the organisation who's home who's away kits uh, the whole shebang so it was a pretty bizarre thing to have to do as a 15 year old to be in charge of loads of sort of 50 to 90 plus year olds mm. uh, as, a, as a bowls club captain. Um, so yeah, if you, if you know me well, you'll remember those days. Um, I'm not uh, actively involved in bowls anymore, but uh, I'm sure I will go back to it one day and I, I, I gained loads from doing what, that. What would, what would you say is the biggest social lesson that that taught you? Um, I think... there's definitely tensions with team selection for example regardless of the dynamic whether you are a 15 year old picking a team you know there are so many different tensions within that as being a bowls captain what would you say, say is the biggest lesson I think the biggest lesson that I learned was perspective right. because I was as, as like a 15 year old or a young person you were usually so just entrenched in your age group mm so social skills for me just were just accelerated so quickly um but also just the perspective of so many people would want to give advice and be like 
don't waste your time or you only get one go at this or if you're 50 50 about something you know give it a go or they would say things like i still regret certain things to this day like don't don't be 50 50 about something and, and not do it like you the things that you do do you don't regret like there were loads of real kind of life lessons that people just tended to bestow upon yeah, yeah. sort of a young a young player yeah. in that in that age group but then back to your point of um selection of players and things like that um yeah balancing egos <laughs> even amongst the older age groups uh, they're still there um less so i do feel though however um and i suppose in terms of tips it would be having uh having no real so 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 in that environment i didn't have like a hard and fast rule for everyone right i managed people separately so i i did have a lot of kind of like different standards for different people based on what they could and couldn't do right so there was a lot of personalization which yeah. again is pretty like on reflection pretty highbrow for someone who's 15 yeah and i'm probably quite unique in that way that i, I did see those things but um also you know just the throwing someone in the deep end you know i was very fortunate in that i swam yeah um it's a single swim situation it really was <laughs> and i wouldn't advise it for everyone mm. um but for me at that point that was that 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 really worked um so yeah and then you were managing a football team yes yeah, so I, th I think we had really similar experiences in that sense very similar age uh, points in our lives and i actually um got talking it was at my uh, my my prom at, at, in year eleven, I got talking to one of my PE teachers who said, "Look, uh, there's a who's involved in one of the local clubs," and he said, "Look, I've got a team that need a manager. Do you want to come and do it?" And I sort of said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll do it." Not really, sort of appreciating the just the the, the multifaceted nature of that term manager because you don't really appreciate it as a child because you just get told what to do by the manager you play etc etc but you, you only really appreciate it when you do it and I did it and it was so so useful for me because I learned so many skills um, but at the same time it was it was it was a struggle it was a real struggle like um, you come back to selection and you talk about selection from a managerial point of view when you're selecting children's sports teams it's not just about those children you take into consideration that actually the people who care probably a little bit more about the selection are actually the parents. Mm. Um, so that's where it's slightly different from your your, your yeah. goals experience because you obviously you select those people and they are just those people and they have their opinion, whatever. But I was I was sort of having these conversations with the children and then the parents, um, which taught me a lot of again social skills um, and about managing expectations and about explaining decisions and about having processes that inform the decisions so not just going like oh well it's going to be so and so it's going well it's going to be this person because of this and this is why x isn't starting and this is why you know all those sort of things so that's what it it really there's a couple of tough lessons in there um that i had to learn from an organizational point of view you're gathering availability you're sending out emails at you know 15 16 and it's just something you're not no one's taught you how to do it and i've just learned from being on these email threads that I just go, well, that's what someone else did. I'll do that. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it, you know, going to Red Hill for a half ache meet on a Saturday morning and just sort of asking parents really sheepishly, like, uh, can I put the balls in the bibs in your car and can I come with you? And yeah, just really, really interesting, but I really loved it. I would recommend it to, on the basis you have a good support network of people there who can help you when you're struggling and you know you have a really good supportive um team of parents behind you which i was really lucky to have um in the, in the actual team itself um i would recommend it to a lot you know if, if if you think it's for you and you want to go into it it's a really really good thing to do i really enjoyed it um yeah so yeah socially it teaches you a lot of skills like that um and as we've touched on very briefly we still Staying with the social aspect, we still play football with our friends um, to this day. But let's move on from, we've done physical now, we've done social. Let's just touch very briefly on the mental aspect of um, sport for us when we were younger and well-being. 
um, and then yeah we'll move on to we'll move on to what we see what we have seen recently in, in, in recent years of working in education but mentally for us I think something we both sport aside just mental our mental well-being when we were younger was I think it was okay but one of the things we struggled with was and I and I know this is a widely held view adults children whatever um, insecurities around your experience that uh, experience insecurities around your appearance yeah do you want to touch on that a little bit yeah I'll, I'll kick off with that one so for me um i know as a kid i i felt like i lacked control at certain points more than others but especially when in and around that sort of just before i you know i got bowls and that was my thing and i could kind of run with that um and then after that a little bit when i was slightly older again i struggled with um, lacking that control which for me led to kind of like more addictive behaviours or yeah. behaviours where I'd try and it would be sort of self not not self-harm but like behaviours that would be self-harming like biting fingernails and things like that and then at the more extreme end of that I started to show early signs of like getting into like bulimia and like um, eating disorders thing and I was really lucky in that my family were able to spot that early help me to sort of not get yeah. to a point where you know I was hospitalized or anything like that it didn't get that far but there were certain certain parts of my psychology where you know if things got bad enough and my self-talk was negative enough those are the sorts of mm. behaviors that would play out for me personally yeah and I know that I was always comparing myself to other people and being like, oh, you know, even yeah. though I was like really sporty and things like that, I'd be like, but I haven't got a six pack, mm. but I have, you know, but I'm not mm. that muscular or but, 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 but. So that for me was kind of where my mental health was. I know I had sort of like a nervous twitch at certain ages and things like that. So uh, that for me was more where my psychological vulnerability and mental health um you know where my wobbles were mm. and then for you it was kind yeah. of similar in some yeah ways. i mean i so when i was younger i i was just naturally quite skinny and still am to this day um and that played on my mind when i was younger because um you know it was something that you know you sort of were just adults would say like oh you know look there's nothing to you and you know you sort of they're not they don't mean any harm by that that's then if, you know if anything they, they mean it in almost like an affectionate way oh there's nothing to you you sort of thinking like, I remember as a kid thinking there is nothing to me like I am just really skinny um and coming back to the the gym thing that we were talking about earlier another one of the drivers for me was just insecurity around my physical appearance I just wanted to be a little bit more toned a little bit more muscular a little bit stronger um, so that's definitely something that I had when I was younger and I had braces as well hmm. um, and then I didn't as in you were bullied for that I, I wasn't or... but I, I wasn't bullied for the braces and I wasn't really bullied per se around my weight it was just like an ongoing thing like oh look how skinny Jack is like not like oh, man, look how skinny is like oh you know he's really skinny I was like you know no, I'm skinny like, mm. and with the braces it was like I have braces for three years four years a long time and no one really bullied me for braces but they were still I was still like oh, they're on my teeth they're there all the time um, and that was that repeated with things like spots when I was older um, I, I, I never really I, I, st I had quite oily skin when I was sort of going through puberty and 14, 15, 16 um, and I definitely didn't take as much effort with my like um, sort of like cleanliness as I should have I should have had a, a better routine with my my facial you know fa face, skincare, face, sort of skincare sort of thing, thing. Um, and as I got older I sort of that became more and more of an insecurity for me and I took more um, care of it and I, and I really do to this day um, but those are definitely things I think we share one and mm. still to this day do appearance insecurities and things like that something you touched on re really briefly was um addictive tendencies mm. and this is something that I don't think we'd actually discussed in length before and I know when we were planning what we were going to say in this podcast you spoke briefly about um, you have quite an addictive personality and one of the ways in which you saw this was gambling I feel very similar that when you turn 18 
the world becomes a very different place because suddenly you're legally allowed to do lots of things. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said that when I was 17, I wasn't having the old, you know, sneaking off a can or whatever I could find in the shed of alcohol over here, these house parties, you know, th these things did happen. But there was no way I could have access to gambling when I was 17. And then you become 18, it's like, right, you can do all these things now. And gambling is one of those things that when I turned 18, I was like, right, I've got a little bit of money. This is quite exciting. I'm going to gamble. Um, and I definitely did it a bit too much. And I definitely could have done a bit more support around it. Um, luckily, I was able to spot it and go, mm, maybe put it back and stop it. But I remember I was at, I was at college, for example, I was just putting like, 25p on games of tennis I just knew nothing about just caught them off for hours um, and I know you come on to it gambling was something that you briefly struggled with well yeah I mean this is where sort of the, the transition from, from, from children to, to adults comes in because we both went to university at different times I mean there's a six year age gap between the two yeah. of us as well which um, some people don't recognise or realise as yeah. well um, but I went to university and studied psychology primarily to sort myself out mm. and help other people because that's kind of the person that I was at that time and you know, still am to, to a great extent um, so for me I w as part of my psychology I think it was second year or third year we got to break into different modules and I was really fortunate that with in uh, Nottingham Trent University where I went with there was a professor uh, Mark Griffiths who's like a big name in, in uh, gambling and addiction yeah. and all that sort of thing. Like, I, I had no idea that I was going to go to university with such a big player in that field. So that was really lucky. But for me, um, yeah, learning about addiction, spotting the danger signs and uh, things like that was like, oh my God, I could then notice and pick up on and realise that it wasn't just in gambling, you know, for me, similar, like, there were times when I was definitely drinking too much or drinking to try and put things to bed mm. that I was, you know, anxi anxious about. Um, so I can't quite remember what your question was there. It was, it was along yeah. that. Mm. So it was going... It's just about sort of in terms of being having an addictive personality, how, so A or one, one point that we both shared was gambling. Yeah. Um, and I did recognise it. How, to what extent was that manifested so in that period of becoming an adult how have you because I know it's something that you know you do struggle with so so addictive personality was interesting because Mark Griffiths that guy we I remember I, I, I would stay late I was that kind of nerdy guy and I would stay late and have, have this kind of conversation with him and be like what do you think about addictive personality because he was kind of like I don't think it exists and I was like hmm that's interesting because mm -hmm. it's a uh, you know some people do some people don't it's still a contentious kind of thing in literature let alone day to day um but i i do feel like i have that inclination that is where i would fall down like if things went wrong in my life that i know is my kind of um that's, stumbling block if that's you my spiraling yeah. down that's yeah. where i would head and, and it's useful to know that it's mm. useful to know the danger signs of yeah. where you would yeah. likely be headed um so yeah for me another thing that I spoke with him with a lot was the prevalence of online gambling and the, um, the advertisement on sports right because at that point yeah. back like 10 years ago or whatever that was quite new and the lack of um, uh, you know advertisers not being there, there wasn't anything there's so much regulation around yeah regulation is the word I'm after um, and I was like I definitely got sucked into this because of the amount of advertisement to like to yeah. to an extent. We're, we're going to talk towards the end of the episode about what we do to combat these things. Mm. We don't want to give away too much now, um, but yeah, I guess what I want to just touch on there is that that is definitely a weakness that we share in terms of our mental well-being. In terms of it, something that we used as a mechanism when we were younger. Yeah, and I still, you know, every now and then, like we go. We were at the horse racing the other month, you know. It's not something we've cut up our lives completely in taboo, like oh, it's, a, it's an awful thing. But I guess it just bring up in this segment that like what we struggle with mental health wise, I know in the past 
it was something we both used as a mechanism to deal with and also when we do do those things we put things in place yeah. in order to make sure that we do have a good time yeah. and we don't exactly. just go oh I lost some money and I'm yeah. going to try and get it back and exactly. you get worse and worse exactly um, now onto what we see yeah so what we see so we've spoken about our experiences of well-being in our childhoods and to this day very briefly there are lots of things we haven't covered but those are some of the ones we have covered um, we're now going to move on to what we see or what we have seen as um, people that have been so you've taught in a classroom, was it three years? Three, yeah, three, three, four years yeah. and then extra bits. Around and I trained for three years and was in very different classrooms uh, and haven't had my own class yet, but I came straight out of university and back into teammates. Um, and these, we're just gonna discuss some of the patterns that we've seen having worked in education for what is combined now, something like eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. um, some of the patterns that we've seen um, and some of the patterns we continue to see. Yep. Um, we're really lucky that we work in a really diverse part of London where we, there is lots of amazing opportunities. Um, there are lots of different groups of people. Uh, there is lots of diversity, as I mentioned. We have a really unique perspective in that sense, don't we? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've obviously seen prior, like most of my teaching time has been within the borough of Richmond. And that comes from teaching to PE coordination yeah. to uh, being a school governor, yeah. like from all different perspectives looked at the exact um, borough that we work mm. within. Before that, I did quite a lot of um, different placement sort of things or work at summer camps yeah, and yeah. stuff when I was younger. And that would be sort of more towards, uh, I did some work out in Windsor, I did some work um, in sort of more central London um, and yeah, we are very self-aware that our lens through which we look day to day is not necessarily generalizable yeah. totally. Yeah. So we, we are aware that some of our perspective on, on things does need to, you know, be tweaked and does does need to take into account if, if we are to generalize anything we say. There are some things that are more prevalent here. There are some things that we will speak about that will be more prevalent in other areas. Um, like you say, our experiences are drawn from different places over what is now quite a few, you know, a few years. So Brighton, Nottingham, like you say, Central London, South London, wherever. So what we touch on is what we see, what we have seen. Mm. will be prevalent in some areas less prevalent in other areas so we don't want to tarnish everything with one brush do we? yeah i guess yeah. that's just what we want to get out there before we before we go into it but i know the first thing we're going to discuss that is something that is prevalent in more areas than others um around the world around the country around even the borough um is we still see and we're talking about physical well-being here um obesity as a as, as an issue as a as a challenge that we as a social uh, we as a society face um, the statistic that I have in my notepad of statistics down here, which is not conveniently placed, is uh, yeah. So obesity, the the NHS report that we looked at that we will reference in the description below. Um, I think it was dated two thousand nineteen. Don't hold me to that. It might not be. We'll make sure we've got the correct link. But um, in within year six pupils in the country, the, the, the one in five basically children are obese at twenty percent. Um, and this is definitely a challenge that to physical well-being, isn't it? Because, like you say, this new, it's coming in, isn't it? The whole mental well-being side of of it all. Um, that's to say, however, that we shouldn't ignore physical well-being. No. Um, and obesity is a problem we face. Um, and yeah, I know that we have seen it, haven't we? In, in, when working in schools. Yeah. It's it's yeah. I, I guess the point again is it is still prevalent. Yeah. All around the world. It's, it's one of those things that all, all around the world, especially the more the developed world, it is a huge, 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 you know, avoidable problem when it comes to financial problems, you know, strains on your, um, your country's budget and all the rest yeah. of it. You know, it is a real impacting uh, things with society. Um, and obviously with obesity, it's right up there in terms of risk factors towards diabetes and the various diseases that you're you're going to get and obviously going to have an impact on your social and your mental mm. health when it yeah. comes to to well-being so yeah. that's that's a huge one and so is activity levels yeah and that's just another thing that we come into contact with obviously as providers of 
sports um, education really. Um, so we try and make our sessions as active as we can. Um, but yeah, in terms of guidelines for yeah, the same same document as well from the NHS. Um, so the, the 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 guideline is, and I asked you to guess this statistic the statistic the other day, and you actually nailed the terminology around it. But it was the guideline is an hour of I believe it's vigorous vigorous exercise a day minimum a mi minimum, uh, and in this document that we're going to reference here, um, the government basically said that 18% of children in the country are achieving this. I don't know what it is globally. I don't know what different countries have as their different minimum requirements, maximum requirements, whatever. Um, but this is the situation in our country. Yeah. Um, and again, physical well-being, physical health comes under the well-being umbrella. And like I said, we try and make sure our sessions are as active as possible. Um, but the reality is that in schools in um, the UK, for example, I know that when I was teaching, I don't know, I, I still think it's the case that there are two hours of PE a week, which then puts impetus on, you know, the evenings after school and you get the playground, you get lunchtime, of course, and you get break time. But in terms of guided physical activity, perhaps there's those two hours in school. And then after school, I know there are different opportunities and different things people can do. And that is dependent, of course, on you know what is available to you and what etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but it's, it's a real challenge isn't it to get that mm. physical well-being in and that physical health in considering the way that our children's days are shaped now because they spend the majority of their time in school and then the afternoon and the evenings are sort of filled with other things and it is tricky isn't it yeah and we we tend to see a lot of a lot of variation mm. like you you we, we get kids some kids who get very little to no sort of after school or pre before school or weekend activity. Meanwhile, we also deal with kids who are basically at national competition level. So that we're, we're in a very unique borough to, yeah. to view sort of, you know, the, the span and the variety of different, yeah. um, you know, things that, that, that children are um, able to make the most of. Mm. Um, so that's another factor that I think that we're going to continue to discuss throughout the rest of our podcast. Yeah. Um, and then the we're going to briefly try and address it at the end, not with some things that we just try and do. That's how this episode is going to work, isn't it? We'll raise a few things that we've noticed. Now we're not going to address them all at the end, but we will do one or two pieces. Yeah, a couple of things we'll allude to uh, podcast episodes to come. Um, and another thing with the more social side of things. So we've touched on the physical. So the more social side of things is the um, interpersonal. Uh, comparisons the kind of keeping up with the Joneses I would I would suggest you'd say with kind of parents and, and adults that would be the kind of way that you talk about it but for children I know we've touched on how we compared to other people how we compared ourselves to other people when we were children or we compared ourselves to athletes that mm. we saw you know didn't even have to be people our own age um, but th that is something that we we constantly deal with within sport when we um, have winners and losers at the very you know that, that that's an, that's an obvious one, but we also have kids who are competing in in within the own their own teams to be like oh so and so is quicker than me or oh so and so is a bit better at whatever it is than than me and everyone trying to be the best person is never really going to work out. But trying to help kids see that is yeah. the challenge Cause, cause, for us because we know that sport in in its origins is very it's relative you know if you have a race obviously there is going to be there is going to be a winner and there is going to be people who come second third fourth there's gonna be first place whatever um but what we've tried to do with what we do is make it is say look we, we we acknowledge that and that's a really interesting but it's a it's, we'll talk more about it i'm sure in a different podcast but it's a really interesting it's a really good driver competition but we've tried to move away from that haven't we at, at teammates We've tried to make it as much of a you versus you sort of comparison. So it's, can you be better than you were yesterday? Okay, that's what we're after. Yeah. Or, you know, how many times can you uh, do a catch in 30 seconds, try and beat your own mm -hmm. score, as opposed to, okay, how many, how many did you get? How many did you get? How many did you get? Oh, you won, well done. Mm -hmm. That's the end of it. Or yeah. try and beat Johnny, or, you know, oh, so-and-so is better than you at that, and always focusing on... You know who's better than, who's the best who's the best who's the best yeah well and we'll, we'll come on to more at the end about how we continue to do that but coming back to comparisons um 
it's essentially, not essentially, it's one of the components of how, how billing does start. Um, so it's putting one person down and comparing them to another and saying, I'm better than you at this for some reason, making them feel bad for that. Um, we have seen that in education, haven't we? Yeah, bullying is one thing that we, uh, you know, I know a lot of schools say, oh, we don't have bullying here or whatever. It's like bullying is way more prevalent than people want to admit to, especially when they're trying to keep their own statistics looking great. But yeah. bullying is something that obviously can now more prevalently be online, which is a new uh, bullying, bullying a lot uh, as, as is the case of a lot of the things we've been talking about bullying has always existed yeah it's just there are we talk about it it's almost like we've undergone a really recent revolution in terms of social media and the internet opportunities for bullying have one of the downsides of, of the internet and social media is unfortunately bullying has had an opportunity to broaden its reach and be more it's happen a lot easier mm. um, because you can be on internet on social media and you can be in big group chats for example and, and, and bullying continue and, and the, one of the things about social media is whatever happens on social media um, tends to be permanent yeah. there is a very clear um, trail of breadcrumbs that can be traced back and um, that, that, that is something that happens on social media isn't it you know, we, when we were younger we could phone people up and, and there was things like MSN and you know social media was just coming into the forefront, but it wasn't as prevalent as it is today. You tended to not really speak to people after school unless you met them at the park or you met them face to face. Um, but now, if you, you can have access to anyone and talk to anyone so quickly that this bullying does happen a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah, easily. and we have um, you know certain sessions where you get one person come along and you think, hmm, so-and-so is not you know, very, seemingly very happy today and you, you know, delve, dive into it a little bit and it's like oh yeah well that's because someone said something about them last night on name that social media platform and you're like ah right okay and then we you know that these are the sorts of things that we that we now are interacting with um as you know uh, a challenge a challenge for children's yeah. well-being socially and, yeah. and all the rest of it and if we talk about comparisons comparisons are become even more crystal clear when they become objective and when they are done based upon metrics and you can measure them. And to some extent, so something like um, Instagram with likes, that's now become very, very easy to compare, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, back to the comparison point, you know, people are now trying to very, it, it, from, from our experience, we're seeing a lot of children who are comparing one another's oh, I got blah, blah likes, whereas you got blah, blah likes, you know, I got more, you got less. That sort of comparison level is is another risk factor that we are involved with. It, it, I think what I what we've seen is children quantify their self-worth sometimes, not all the time, but it has happened before I've seen them quantify their self-worth based upon their likes. Mm. And that comes from comparison. And that, And this is the sort of thing that has always happened and this is, you know, pre-internet. This is this is not a new problem. It's just that the internet, social platforms, they have sort of just magnified certain certain uh, aspects here. Yeah. Well, I mean, when we were at school, I know, for example, that I was comparing my test results to other children's test results. Yeah. And the education system is very metric in that sense, in that you get a test result and that's you. You would not not how. I think personally education should be, but children can become, if you want to look at it that way, just a school. But that's what happened when we were younger and just that platform has changed really and the environment has changed. And more on that in terms of that our safeguarding responsibilities have changed to some extent, haven't they? Yeah, so now uh, from our uh, teaching hats on, coaching hats on and, and, and all the rest of it, we have to make sure that we look out for risk factors, make sure we look out for uh, any behavior changes and there are you know lots of red flags that we can then then look for to pass on information to safeguarding leads and things of that sort and now um there are more up-to-date things that we also need to take into account with the Absolutely. social platform side Absolutely. i know things. i know for, it might be monday might be monday might be last week it was um cyber awareness day mm. and that just is, would have been would have been to us an alien concept when we were at school mm. whereas now it's really useful thing to have and it's just the landscape has changed and it's bringing awareness to the landscape and how it has changed and putting in things to deal with that. 
And I know we've touched here quite a bit on social media and that's because coming soon is going to be a podcast specifically based on that because from the feedback we've had from the parents, teachers uh, and coaches that we have interacted with before um, releasing all of our um, podcasts and everything, that's one thing that a lot of people have said, please talk about that. So that's why we've gone a bit heavy there. And then back to the mental health side of our communication with adults now um, we tend to have within our interaction with the parents at the moment with, with where we are we tend to have a lot of conversations around resilience around um, you know my kid didn't get picked or so and so saying mean things to them or you know is, is this actually what happened because my child has told me that this happened it's like oh no that didn't that wasn't exactly what happened and blah, blah, blah. so for, for us um more prevalent things that we've had to deal with recently are primarily around resilience depressive characteristics within children you know feeling low feeling down um and then uh similarly to ourselves um things around controlling behaviors like eating disorders and things that things like that, especially within sport, eating disorders like that's one of the risk factors associated mm-hmm. with it. So these are the sorts of things that we've uh, been in closer contact with as coaches um, and also teachers. Um, so yeah, that's a, another thing that we will continue to touch on and talk about yeah. as we move I, forward I, I, and bring I, on guests. I'm, I'm conscious as well that we're all, we. It's easy in these sort of conversations to be doom and gloom. Yeah, um, and it's not all doom and gloom at all no. because if we talk about um, so for example we do and there are loads of things out there that provide brilliant opportunities for positive impacts on mental physical and social well-being for children but if we talk about like we're going to do all the time um, talk about what we do um, for example just one thing we, we train our we do the squads in the morning don't we and those sessions and I was talking to my friend um, uh, I was talking to my friend Maisie last night hi Maisie and I said to her, oh yeah, she was like, oh, how was your day? And I was like, yeah, good, I was at work this morning, 7.30 till nine, and she was like, what are we doing now? I was like, oh, it was just a training session. She's like, what, the, you train, the children train every day before school? And each squad that we do trains once, one day a week, don't they? But just that sort of, I like to think that builds character, doesn't it, in certain ways, our, our weekly training session. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, getting up straight away and having exercise, exposure to sunlight, like lots of different things, the social interaction, the physical side of things, loads of those things have been associated, you know, with regards to literature as, you know, good for mood, just, just good for well being. Just on those commitments. They're really good to keep up on. Big time. Um, and I think a lot of the things that we're going to talk about within the podcast, within weeks to come, as, as well as today, the things that we try and um, promote in terms of behaviors to change either can remove you from the depths of you know things going worse or can get you from a good point to an even better point yeah. like it's, this isn't all just about you know try and get you out of the bad stuff this is about from going from good to great yeah as well um, cool. which is really important uh, so now we're going to move on to some of the actions that we uh, have taken in the past and that we take now that we do now uh, to combat some of the things we've spoken about and to maximize some of the positives we've discussed as well. So the first thing that, that, that we, we, what we do to try and improve children's wellbeing, and this is our goal, isn't it? This is our mission. Um, mm. So we're not gonna cover everything we do, but we're gonna cover some of the points that you know we just wanna mention in this episode. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start you off by teeing up here, Tom, accountability. So accountability is something that we ourselves try and take on. So accountability meaning controlling what we can control and being aware of how our actions can lead to what it is that the children are doing. So for example, as coaches, if we're mucking about on the sidelines and having, you know, sort of like silly banter between us, and then we go and stand in front of the children and say, right, everyone listening in and go, why are you being silly? It's like, right, hold on, accountability. What is the example that I've set prior to that? What are the, how have we created the environment ready for me to be annoyed that they're doing what I was doing myself? Uh, other things 
around basically how are we complicit in the problems that we yeah. want to avoid yeah. so it could be um it could be the leading by example thing or it could be a lot of other different things where our reactions to things are making things worse so that's, yeah. that's taken a lot of almost soul searching for us isn't it um it's, in that I mean, we've had to look up, look and go actually i'm going to sneeze <laughs> oh, excuse me um excuse we're me. not looking and going i'm going to sneeze but we're looking and going um what is it that we're, we're falling short because mm. i think when we were guilty when we were younger definitely in the early days of teammates when we were younger coaches and whatever you just sort of take it as gospel unless you've got someone there to mentor you and say look you're doing really well but maybe do this differently you sort of don't get time to go mm, that didn't really work or that did work um and we've had to go take a step back and go to ourselves and to each other this needs to change this is our fault what can we do differently yeah and also a big part of that is taking on feedback and getting rid of our egos basically as, as best we can um i know i sense the the irony here of, of this being pretty much the tom and jack show and saying get rid of your ego but the idea of trying to make sure that you are not falling into the trap of me 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 mm. but thinking what's best for the what's best for the team not not my way but our way yeah and we are working together for the, sh for, the for, for a shared goal it's not we're the coach you work for me it's we are working together for for a shared goal yeah. um so accountability is the is probably the big thing that we see when it comes to other coaches teachers sometimes parents i know we ourselves obviously are not parents so we feel um that we can't really pass judgment on parents as as much as we can within coaches because of our experience um but we know that with people who blame other things mm. they are really putting themselves at, you know at a detriment basically if you're blaming blaming the situation with with children under your supervision on external factors you are really limiting what it is that you can do for those children instead of going yeah. how can yeah. i change how what are the things that we could do to you know put them in a, a better environment for this yeah. is more like because because there are um and we touched on this don't we in one of our how we coach episodes but there are external factors that you cannot control and it's important to accept them and go that that is a hundred percent out of my control but one of the things that is a hundred percent out of your control for example is the weather um what that is out of your control what is not out of your control is how you react to the weather and we've in the past had to deal with that and you know we've been like oh, i can't believe it's raining well, that's so rubbish we we, we 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 can't go outside oh god what are we going to do where now we've actually gone right it is raining but we can control the fact that we've got a backup plan and this is what we're going to do in our backup plan and we've thoroughly thought it, thought it through and it has got planning to it it has got you know thought behind it there's method behind those indoor sessions so that's something that we've sort of changed haven't we um i'll move on from accountability mm -hmm. um something else we try and do for the children in order to build their make their decision making process is more autonomous and therefore they can learn the lessons that they want to from their choices yep. is give them autonomy give them choices um outline our expectations and agree the expectations with them but put boundaries in place in order for them to learn make mistakes make their own choices in a safe to fair environment yeah so in terms of choices for children um we know that a lot of people will outright go oh hold on old school children should only speak when they're spoken to and all the rest of it but we found that actually long term in term it, it, with respect to getting people to actually want to do those behaviors that are desirable longer term you need to get them to understand why and you need to get them to make those choices themselves as opposed to going got to do that i said so that's the end of it um, so we're quite pro-choice and saying well we've got this and this is going to lead to that or we've got this and this is going to lead to that in the past we potentially as another thing we do is kind of a, a good sort of like how to win friends and influence people um, t 
tip is usually about getting uh, the children to listen to you making that mistake yourself yeah. beforehand. So I remember when I was a kid and I did this and this is what it led to, storytelling as opposed to going, no, I know why, this is the, the, the best way of doing it is going, oh, well, I remember this when I was a kid, this is what happened, it's your choice. And then they're much more likely to go, hmm, memorable story, got to make that choice, the yeah. good one. And I can do that in the future yeah. as well, instead of having to be banged on the head every time that yeah, it's like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, and you've just jogged my memory by looking over at the bookcase over there. Um, a, a, you know, there are lots of brilliant books on there we've drawn inspiration from, but one of them is Simon Sinek, who uh, his, one of his big things and his, you know, the thing that's most resonated with, with us, I think, is starting with why. Um, I think it's easy for, to take for granted, as I think for us, is that we just expect the children to know sometimes that we want to help them and that we're there to support them. Um, and it can become sometimes like, well, why are we doing this? Or it did become like that in the past. Like, why, why, why are we doing this? You know, why are you making us do these really difficult shuttle runs where we have to run back and forth a few times and go, because we said so. Actually, it's allowing the children to understand that we, so for example, uh, metaphorically okay guys today we're going to be doing a uh, shooting session not because I said so not because um, it's just how it is but we're going to be doing a shooting session because in the last game uh, our shooting wasn't particularly effective and it could be improved and it is that whole starting with why and that has transformed the way I look at trying to like just just work with other people just seeing like if I'm doing something with somebody whether it be like at home sort of with my parents I said well what, why are we doing this I go well we're doing this because of this specific reason it makes people go yeah actually I agree with that reason or you go, well I don't think that's the right reason you go okay let's align the reason and work out why it is we're doing it it happens a dialogue yeah and that driver and that why has been instrumental isn't it in what we do big time and I know we didn't write it down here to, to go through but from the Simon Sinek thing around starting with why and, and, and things like that. I think we touched on it earlier on with comparisons with teammates and our sports coaching company and how we interact with the children. Probably the biggest thing and the underpinning of the ethos that we had there was all about doing your best mm. and having the long term mm. in mind as opposed to having the short term, did I win the match? That's the be all and end all. Meltdown if I lose you know as ecstatic if I win repeat that kind of like burr, 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 like extreme, extreme highs extreme lows and instead going right long term so the analogy is like you know say for example you play one game of football you either win or you lose it and that's uh, kind of like a finite one game job done but if you look at it from an infinite approach it's like one game of football doesn't make very much difference when it comes to winning the um, the league or the bigger borough event or getting down the line when you're older. You can't win. There, there, there is no such thing as winning winning football. Like no one is the best at football. Every year, year on year, you'll have whoever wins the league at this, whoever wins the league at that, whoever wins that trophy, and what have you. But the the longer term approach we try to take is you learn the lessons along the way so that you can be better for the next match and you put yourself at, at an advantage play as many games as possible yeah and get invited back to play in the yeah. next game instead yeah. of throwing a oh you yeah. can't move that and everyone go actually I don't really want to play with you anymore yeah it's like no 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 you you really do want people to yeah. want to play with you so that yeah. you get invited back and you have a longer yeah. career it's it's I mean I remember. That this working when I was um, I was actually um, childminding when I was like a, a few years ago now I must have been I was, I was a lot younger and it was, it was I was childminding I was trying to get this um, and I, this was one of my first like oh hmm, I might change the way of, I, di I didn't, didn't know about Simon Sinek but it worked really well I was like I was trying to get this child to um, go and brush their teeth I just like I don't want to do it I was like well if you don't do it at the end of the day your teeth are going to fall out which is quite a harsh truth it's quite a harsh why, but I think long term. Yeah, long, yeah, but we we just overlooked that in the past, and we have that just the drivers, the whys. 
are so important and it's I think it's been easy for us in the past to forget them. So now we put them at the forefront, don't we? Um, so there's a little bit there about choices, about expectations, about our, you know, how we explain to the children you know, why we're doing it, why it is what we're doing. Um, and then we move on to the last thing, which is about pouring from an empty cup. And you can't pour from an empty cup, can you? And helping ourselves before we can help others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have massively, massively um, learned the hard way through trying to give, 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 and then you fatigue yourself. Um, I know that I got to a stage of burnout when I was teaching where I just gave too much from a, from a good place, like, I, you know, pure compassion. Like I want to try and do as much as I can for everyone else, mm. but to a detriment where I actually can't do yeah. as well as I can for everyone else. As if I had been looking after myself, I would have done them a better service. Yeah. So um, leading by example is also a, a, a massive thing because say for example, in that time for me, when I was you know, facing burnout as a teacher, I know I wasn't modeling the right ways to probably communicate, probably wasn't modeling the best ways to eat, the best ways to rest, the best ways to you know, get, get from point A to point B. Like my face probably wasn't you know, showing the right emotions for those children, so that again was was not helping them um, without being careful about it because um, it it did come from the, the the right place but if you if you do do too much yourself for other people without looking after yourself you do them a disservice yeah you, you, you've got to be able to walk your talk because that comes from a point of trust as well if you're if you're leading people to, to try and do something if, if they look at you and go well you're not willing to do that you know there's a real breakdown of the trust there uh, and ultimately it's not gonna, you know, like you say, you cannot be the best version of you without taking care of the best version of you and, you know, taking the time to make sure you are, you are at your best. Um, so that's a massively, massively prevalent thing for us, isn't it? That's one of the biggest uh, learnt the hard way things that we now believe in mm -hmm. as um, people who are you know, take, taking care of, of children, basically. Children being under our supervision, we now take a lot more care of our own well-being in for their benefit as well as yeah. our own. Yeah. Um, which brings us probably to the, our, our last point of the, of the podcast today, which is now ways in which we look after ourselves for their benefit. Yeah. Um, so obviously this podcast is all about children's well-being but actually, within this first podcast, we're going to talk about ways in which we help ourselves to help them. Which, so, is, which is essentially as well what we want to do through Tom and Jack. We want to help other people to, in order to help children. Absolutely. So we will come to other points where we do have specific, this is for children and other things. But for this one, we're going to go about how we help ourselves to help them. So um, do you want me to start off? Yeah, yeah you, go for it, man. you go for it. Um, for me, the, the big big difference when it came to my um, la la later years of teaching and early part of going full-time with, with teammates was sorting out the, the basic main three and that being diet sleep and exercise those three things just having a an actual focus on them and not not measuring them to you know sort of extremes or anything but being able to log it and be like mm -hmm okay even on just like apps on your phone and things like that how many hours sleep did i get or uh you know did i did i do exercise this week by just having a bit of a a week plan and things like that made a huge difference and since then i've then kind of done that way way way, way more so now i've got to a point of morning routines i found them to be really useful so this morning for instance I got up and I had next to no energy. I mean, I've recently got back from a, a jet lag kind of situation flight from Thailand. So I'm still in the, I'm still not back in the right time, time zone perfectly yet. Um, and for me, I woke up and I felt knackered, even though I'd had like nine hours sleep because I'm still in that catch up phase. Um, but I knew we were having this podcast today and I thought, right, what's the advice I'm going to give? And I was like, right, first things first, drink, drink some water boom drunk drunk some water like a cup that size straight away next thing gonna go and have a shower and do the cold 
the, the you know the whole hot cold situation so for me i three four years ago started getting into doing extreme cold things and also you know stuff in the sauna as well for for, for hot as well but yeah i mean when we go to the gym together we both go to the the spa your ability to just get an ice bath and then get in that sauna is something i am i'm very envious of it's incredible so i do i do um a, a cold a cold shower every morning but that doesn't mean i just jump in it and it's cold in the winter i've found that that does not work it can work in the summer but in the winter it doesn't work because if for me i have sort of like uh mild Reynolds sort of uh proclivity to just get cold hands and cold feet um so i found that actually if i just go cold shower and then jump out of the cold shower and it's cold and it's february then you know I then just get really, really cold, so that's not good. So what I do in the in the winter is I go hot shower, and then I have like one minute or two minutes, or as long as I can, you know, have that day because it might be like, wait, I'm, I'm out to go and do this, and I'm late. But a good period of time of doing cold shower, just a cold tap, nothing else. And in order to get through that, I do some breathing methods. So I do something like um, like box breathing, for example, which is like four seconds in, four seconds hold four seconds out four seconds in and that's the box so you're in hold yeah. out hold um that's been a really useful one for me and then lastly of those um key things in, in my mornings that i try and do wherever i am so that was like trying to do it in thailand as well the other the other time uh is then finish with a bit of uh me- meditation so for me recently I've got into doing one called, I think it's called loving kindness meditation. For me, that's the one that I've gone for, which is basically just going and wishing yourself and other people well. So you just get out of your own head and start thinking positively about other people as well as yourself, just as a bit of a primer to be like, let's go. Um, And then I try and do exercise of some description. Like, Like yesterday, for example, I was just like, I know we're going to be doing some work and I haven't got too long. I just did a, just a quick little walk lap of the, it was literally just like one mile or whatever it was. Podcast was in, listening to something or other or an audio book. Back I come. It's just tick yeah. those. If I tick those things off in my mornings, 90% of the time I know I'm going to have a good start to my day. Cool. Cool. I mean, I'm going to put my hands up and say I haven't got as, as, as thoroughly planned and as effective way of stopping my days um, and I don't <laughs> the whole morning person day person I don't know a uh, night person I don't know how there much credibility is that there is to that and how much you can change what you are and etc cetera, etc cetera. but I know we work different in, in those ways and that I'm slightly more um, active in the sort of later mornings and the early afternoons and the uh, evenings um, something that I've tried to do is break my weeks up by just just seeing friends midweek mm. um, and that doesn't mean a big sort of meal it doesn't mean you know anything too drastic it means literally just going and having an opportunity to meet midweek just break the week up have a chat and um, because for example I, did, I went for a chat with my, with my dad the other day I was just like I haven't done this in years um, and it just provides I found for me anyway, for some people it might not work, but I found for me it just provides a really good opportunity just to talk mm. and get things off your chest. Um, something else that's come to the forefront for me in the past few years is we, we got a dog. Um, I know you recently got a cat. Um, different pets for different people and different needs. So <laughs> Very rookie to base. Very rookie nice. um, But different pets work for different people, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got a dog and I've just, the dog has been a, a was initially I thought, oh, I've got to go walk the dog. And now I'm like, yeah, I'm walking the dog. It's a really good opportunity to just walk, 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 even without a dog, just walk. Um, so those are two things that I've done in the past. And they, they, I don't know, a lot of people do them. They might seem simple, but they work for me. Mm. Um, and that's really, really been important for me. Um, it hits on those main, those main three things, doesn't it? Dog yeah. walking, it's like the social, it's the physical, and it's the, yeah. the mental. Go dog yeah. walking quite a lot and see parents or go to walking with some friends sometimes um so yeah it's really i found it really useful Hmm. um and then i think the last thing we'll finish on is just exercise in general for the pair of us we talked spoke about it at the start of the session it is just one of the main things that um we do 
I think just day in day out, isn't it? It's just so important. For me, um, there's a uh, I can't remember where I where I heard it, so I can't attribute it to where uh, whoever whoever said it. But it was like get out of your head, get into your body. Mm. That whole sort of just doing exercise. It's very hard to go. Oh, I wonder what if what I said to so and so has you know made them feel really bad about that thing. Uh, or oh actually also later I've got to make sure that I mention this to so and so when you're trying to you know deadlift something or yeah. you're sprinting mm-hmm. or you know whatever whatever those those um, exerting yourself physically things are it's a real release and I know that that's that's true for especially you know sport in general you see you know people really being able to get out of their head in a sporting environment when it's like right you know we've got three minutes to go it's this that and the other and really really up as a line and all that sort of thing so but I think for the pair of us sport has from a young age been a a really useful almost meditative be like be in the moment sort of state that we've been able to yeah. not like pure escapism and yeah, yeah. you know all the problems I'm going to put in a box and I'm and I'm not going to address them ever, but almost flow, isn't it? But a flow state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there we are. Um, covered a lot in there. Covered a lot. First podcast. Yeah. Done. I'm going to shake hand right now. Yeah. Well. Well done. Well in. Um, I hope that you know you guys, the viewers, were able to take some value from that. I hope there was some stuff in there that you found interesting. Um, our next podcast, I believe, is going to be with Amanda Lamb, isn't it? It is. Um, is. And we discuss all manner of things in there, including well-being, uh, work-life balance and parenting. So check that out. We're really excited about that, aren't we? Absolutely. And we're going to have a, a variety of different podcasts coming up. So some of them will be just a pair of us where we've done a bit of research and we're talking about you know, our hot takes on certain things. Other times we will have guests on. Um, so that we can have their specialism uh, and their points yeah. of view come across. Learn from the learn from the, their experiences in their their roles and their their life, really. Absolutely. We also got how we coach, haven't we? So yeah, if you head over to YouTube, um, that is where we will have very specific uh, how we coach. If you're into sports coaching, it is kind of designed for you. However, from showing lots of different people before the release of of, of, uh, of How We Coach and the whole Tom and Jack thing, uh, lots of parents have said that the tips that we've come out with have been useful and can be transferred to parenting and also teachers to teaching. So worth a check out, the How We Coach series. We won't spoil anything, but they are very specific topics with very, hopefully, usable and tangible things that you can do to um, to improve to as well. Yeah. Um, or that we do, and then you can choose whether you want to do them or not. Well, I'll tell you what, by the time this is out, it will be episode one, effective feedback. And Done. we'll put that in the description. Done. There you go. There's your deal. Simple as that. Thank you very much. Um, well, you've been Tom. I have been Tom. Yeah. I've been Jack. This has been the Team Talk uh, on Wellbeing. We hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you for watching. As always, go well. Ciao.